reminder, a couple of different things that we've covered. Envelope of function, capacity, looking to be able to expand envelope of function. That enables us to be able to move away from good movements or bad movements towards how prepared are we for movements or for activities? How do we expand the envelope of function? Have to have got to the point where we're dealing with uh, an acceptable amount of pain. How do we do that? We either use the numerical rating scale or mild, moderate, severe, as it might be described. And we need to be able to do that both in the session and up to 24 to 48 hours afterwards for saying whether something is tolerated with acceptable pain. Touch it, nudge it, tease it. And that was those levels that we just mentioned. Dosages chart, that is going to be, again, something key for you to have as a reference point for, for what I'm going to go through in this session. But to be honest with you, the large part of what this session is going to be is going to be the assessment because the ankle and the hamstring, which will be subsequent lectures after these, will stem off a similar assessment process. So we're not going to get too much of the actual knee rehab exercise today. That will all be in the next session. It's going to be largely around the assessment today. And this sort of birds, I, this is how I brainstorm my thinking process on my chalkboard, which is behind me here. This, when you get onto the PDF, is basically an overview of the testing process then levels one, two, three, and four with how we would dictate whether someone goes to level one, level two, level three, or level four as to how, as uh, according to the Sancho structure there. So, you know, we're not going to get to too much of that today, but, you know, you've, you've got that to be able to look at if you, if you uh, want to be able to see a splat of what this presentation and my shoulder and my knee rehab program here is really building upon. And this paper here by uh, by Pete Maliaris, Joe Cook, uh, Craig Purdom, and Abby Rio is a really nice case. It's on your blackboard around managing uh, managing difficult or challenging patella tendinopathies. So, who gets patella tendinopathy? And that's going to be a first uh, really important point. Something. Maybe it's influenced why I've done this one first, because I've been dealing with, with it myself the last 18 months. And it tends to be your people who jump a lot. That's why we got this name of a jumper's knee, which most people will be familiar with. And it tends to be your most powerful athletes. So it will not be typically a sedentary diagnosis. It will be one where people are not deconditioned. They are your explosive athletes they'll be your sprinters they'll be your jumpers and it will also be it'll tend to be their most powerful leg and that's something that we see quite consistently and that's certainly something i can um marry up with my personal experience it's my left knee that's given me problems and my left is my far more powerful side so of course that's not always going to be the case but um yeah, the name Jumper's Knee comes from, from it being based around it happens to the most powerful people. And what are the aggravating factors? Well, just as you can see where this finger is touching here on the inferior pole, it will be very accurate local palpation that will be provocative. Going downhill is going to be significantly worse than going uphill. Let's look at that in seconds to why that might be the case. Anything that involves prolonged sitting, where you're going to be in a flex position, direct compression and deep movements beyond 90 degrees of knee flexion. OK, so the in the general principles, we looked at the two most uh, important things with a, with a, a sensitized or pissed off uh, limb. And those were compression and high and fast load somewhere in somewhere somewhere in someone's history they have had a training error they have exceeded their capacity to be able to adapt doing something and these 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 are some typical things that they will be they'll have changed their training so that they're either doing some more uh, different terrain stuff whether going uphill or downhill maybe they're coming back from 
a period of not training and then coming back and going hard with the same level as they were doing before. Something will happen and it will, will be in there. And a careful history and unraveling that over time might, might find that. If you were working with me, it would have been a lot of deep knee flexion work and then a one-off event running downhill. Penavan, which you might be familiar with, is sort of between where I am now and where you guys are. And one-off session sprinting downhill was enough to make me weight bearing intolerant. So that one session, again, that one event was not necessarily a problem, but it was, it turned out to be the problem because that exceeded my capacity, running downhill hard. And that is um, what we need to bear in mind here with that once, once we have exceeded and we've, we've sensitized and, and wound up the tissue, then the compression, which is for the knee, deeper, dip, deeper range of knee flexion and high and fast loads. So walking, running and jumping, those then become what we are really irritated by. I'm going to play this video because this is a really nice um, short demonstration of the London Hospital test, which is a test for um, giving you good, pretty good confidence of, of having a patella tendinopathy from the, uh, the physio tutor guys. In this video, we are going to take a look at the Royal London Hospital test for patella tendinopathy, also known as jumper's knee. Get our very own assessment ebook and mobile app. Links are in the video description. Hi and welcome back to PhysioTutors. Patella tendinopathy is one entity of anterior knee pain syndromes and is a frequently encountered clinical picture in those who do jumping sports such as volleyball, basketball, or track and field running, for example. Jill Cook et al. in 2001 evaluated the validity of tendon palpation in the diagnosis of the condition and reported a sensitivity of 68% and low specificity of 9% when comparing to visible tendinopathic lesions on ultrasound. Mafoli et al., who previously had proposed the Royal London Hospital test for Achilles tendinopathy, now examined a similar test to diagnose patella tendinopathy and compared it to manual palpation as well. They found a sensitivity of 88 and a specificity of 98% for the Royal London Hospital test in their small sample of 30 patients. In their study, Manual palpation also yielded markedly higher sensitivity and specificity compared to Jill Cook's study, though the definition of a positive finding on ultrasound was different and setting for patient recruitment deferred as well. So despite the high numbers, the clinical value remains moderate. To conduct the test, the patient lies in supine and the patella tendon is palpated for local tenderness from proximal to distal while the knee is extended. Once local tenderness is elicited, the tender portion of the tendon is again palpated, but now with the knee in 90 degrees, which puts the tendon under tension. The test is considered positive if the pain is markedly reduced or absent in knee flexion. The reason why symptoms decrease with the tendon under tension is unknown. So that's the London, uh, the Royal London Hospital test, which is a good test for being able to, to, to get a diagnosis or at least a working diagnosis of where, uh, where we might have a patella tendinopathy. Um, there's a little video link here also that gives a nice short overview of the management or the assessment of, of patella tendinopathy from those guys. So um, if you're unfamiliar with that test, then that is a good one. That's a good one to become familiar with, have a practice and get used to doing it. That inferior pole is, is where a, the symptoms in a, in a load intolerant knee is going, to be, is going to be found. And if you were to press that again on me, on me, particularly in that extended position, it would, not so much now, I, I, I've managed to get on, top of, um, get on top of symptoms and function is pretty good in my knee now, but certainly six months ago, uh, I would have tried to jump and you would have pressed it. 
So here are some differentials around the structures in the knee that you need to be aware of, at least and consider around whether we're going to have a patella for more joints that we could, you know, potentially have a slightly more diffuse pain presentation rather than localized. Um, a, 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 a quad tendon tendinopathy, which is where you'll get the pain being more of the superior pole of the patella, is more consistent with sedentary people and um, even middle-aged women, menopausal, the team seems to be the, the cohort that will come with a more superior anterior knee pain than this one on the inferior pole. You've got some groups that you should be aware of with kid, uh, young young athletes, um, Sinding Larsen Johansson, Osgood Slaters and different growth plates, etc. And being aware of being aware of these is going to be something that should be a factor in our um, in our diagnosis. Now, here is the an important component in the load tolerance gradient assessing and finding someone's load tolerance. This is the battery of tests and in the order that we will do this with our athlete or patient to be able to client to be able to establish what they're able to do. Now I've got a video here of me explaining this that I'm going to run it through but this is the order of tests, a decline squat, I've got videos to go through these as well, then so that's contesting our compression. What is the amount of compression that we're able to tolerate? And then incremental increases in high and fast loading. We need to find where someone's loading is at to be able to get going. We're going to go through a battery of progressive high and fast load tolerance tests for the lower limb. Okay, so in our assessment, we will perform this battery of tests and the first and foremost thing that we're after is finding and provoking what our tolerance for high pass load is. Okay, so this is going to be relevant for the uh, for the heel and the Achilles and for the knee. First and foremost, they're probably going to be our most pop popular ones that are going to be presenting and we're going to, first, first what we're going to do is a double leg counter movement jump and we're going to probably put a mark on the floor so that we can see where we're taking off and where we're landing two legs and we can use our arms and our momentum, jump as high as we can and land. Okay, and first and foremost, one of those is that, can we tolerate that or has that brought on unacceptable pain in the knee or the Achilles? If not, and we can tolerate that, then it is, um, we'll have a rest for a, for a moment and then we'll do four or five. And we will try and do those consecutively with a lap with a stick and land in between. So we would be jumping as high as we can, land, high as we can, land, high as we can, land, and see what four or five repetitions of that would do. If we are able to tolerate that, we would move on to, if it's the Achilles, probably a more specific loading and lock the knees. So we do the same thing with some double leg, stiff knee, hops. Trying to keep the ground contact as short as we can and trying to jump as high as we can in sub maximal hops. If we tolerated that, then the next one that we would move on to would be some sub maximal single leg hopping. And this is where it becomes really useful to have a mark on the floor so that when we're watching it back on video or if we're watching it with our coach, we can see not only if we're able to do it, but we can get a sense of quality and our ability to stay on the spot. So in terms of a stiff leg submaximal uh, single leg hop, we would see if we can. Hop on spot for maybe 15 seconds or for five to 10 reps. Now we would do that on both sides and Firstly, again, we're looking for uh, have we found our low tolerance test with regards to pain. If we haven't and we're able to do it, then we can move on to deep and slow maximal single leg jumps. 
Um, again, what we're going to try and do with those is we'll start on the spot, and then we're going to go into more knee flexion, which is going to probably be much more loading through the knee. If this is a knee person that we are testing, um, we're going to be jumping as high as we can and try and stick and land in the same place. Can we do one? If that's fine. Can we do three or four? Again, if someone is sensitized or early in the, the assessment process, that's going to probably have lit up their low tolerance test. And we've got them, whatever the hardest level of low tolerance test we have for someone on assessment, then becomes our mark for progression further down the line when we retest. The next one on from this deep and slow hop would be a triple forward hop. So standing on the on a mark and then being able to bound single leg as far as we can for three hops and stick, which is a lot more horizontal deceleration force. And we'll probably catch the knee in the less in the less sensitized ones that are able to tolerate high load. But that test will probably get them and when we compare that left to right, then we'll probably be able to see a clinically relevant difference. If it's 50 centimetres or more, then we've got a marker to be able to, to be able to balance and get back to return to play um, or return to work. And that's all regarding a progressive series of high fast load tolerance tests. Now, with regards to return to play and further down the line, if we have a way of measuring our job performance. It gives us the ability to be able to compare injured side to non injured side and to be able to train and improve our ability to accept and produce force very quickly, which is power, which is what tends to be what we are unable to tolerate when, when we've got a, a tendinopathy, for example. So if you have um, the yeah, app My Jump is as an example. You can track this yourself or you can video yourself in slow motion doing these tests nice and accurately, and then you can send them to a healthcare professional who is able to then look at and work with the data to be able to compare and help track and follow balancing left and right in terms of flight time, in terms of ground contact time for our jump performance. So if we're going to be able to do that, we're going to need to be able to be nice and accurate. I've got some videos to show you how we might, how I might set up to be able to do that. But being able to do these tests, like our counter movement jump, being able to land nice and clean on the same place we take off. In our single leg jumps, maybe we are just going to be testing so that we can see how high we can jump on one side compared to the other. Um, and, we, and then we can track that once, once the pain provocation is down, and we've got it as a, as a power marker. So that's the series, or that's our thinking process in an incremental load tolerance testing series. We need to be able to get the point that we can reproduce their symptoms to establish what they can tolerate. Now, if someone can get all the way through that and through proper, proper effort, so the triple hops for distance, and they can, and they're describing they've got knee pain, then those people are still pretty high functioning. Their knee pain isn't stopping them doing that much. In that instance, if they're still describing that they've got knee pain, then it might have to be more activity specific for the load tolerance. So it may be that, okay, in the clinic you're testing, I'd need to find ways to increase the load even more. So I may even do this, the triple hops holding a load. I may have to do it under fatigue, so get them tired on a rowing machine or something first, or it has to be out and in the field where they're a fell runner and or they're a runner and it comes on at seven miles and that would then be how they would describe hopefully in their training diary that we could get them to be able to establish that the ISKS consistently seems to be coming on at about seven miles so that would be their load tolerance but if they have got um, patellar tendinopathy these series of tests 
are going to get most of them. So this was that app that I mentioned there that is a really helpful way of of getting some objective markers on these on these plyometric um, parts of rehab if you are mobile and you don't have fancy equipment which most people won't um, if it's on your phone cost 10 quid and it tells you things like jump height you have this um, you have this is what it looks like and basically there's two buttons here so that as you jump it's in slow motion so that you have to press the point that you leave the floor and then you keep pressing it and then it goes in slow motion to the jump and then it comes down then you have to press the button again to tell it when you land and then from that it can calculate things like how high in centimeters that you jumped you can do the same thing for being able to test ground contact time so if someone is spending a long time on the floor then on their left right side compared to their right side then we can see these things on on the app and it's nice to be able to see objective measures around around performance it gives again people some motivation for, for working on these things if we're prescribing them but here is I put this as a gradient the tests of the um, first one is the decline squat or compression okay so let me just come right to that I can't get that in full screen So this is your decline squat. You want to be able to do this on an incline board so it takes the ankle emphasis out. You want to keep your torso upright and then it's a case of going then and descending. You know, I'm, I'm holding on to this here because I'm doing this actually on a hack squat machine, but you could do this on an incline board on the floor. You can do this on you know, just lifting your heel on a curb. You know, you can be creative around reproducing the decline squat, but this upright torso puts biomechanically biases the, uh, the, the, the movement to be a knee, a knee dominant movement and is often when someone has a patellar tendinopathy, this, patellar tendinopathy, this is an aggressive test. So the first 10 to 20 degrees will, will bring on symptoms. Now we want to be able to note the intensity of the, of the pain that someone describes through here. So again, we're looking for whether this pain is acceptable or unacceptable. And then we also want to be able to make a note of of the angle that symptoms come on because again both of these are markers for where someone's at and how we're going to progress so that was that was me going through a couple of examples uh, where I am using myself this is let's have a look at this one this is turn that off this is a stiff knee stiff knee hop and this is going to be one that's going to be generally okay for a knee it's going to be very provocative for for a patella but what you will be able to see there is on the floor in front of me this is the my jump app so that's filming me there so i can then do the assessment on myself for ground contact time and height afterwards of course if it's um, a low tolerance test, it could be purely symptoms that we are after. Slow and deep sub-maximal hop. So this is where we are spending longer on the floor, but it's going to be a, it's a little bit pixelated there on yours, but the idea is to put, the test that you can see is to be able to accept more knee flexion and then counter movement jump as high as we can that's going to be a far more aggressive test for a for an irritated knee so in that we'd maybe do four or five reps and what we are also able to do now when you can see this you can see I, I do it on a star here but we're able to see from side to side and we can get an idea also around the quality of the movement. We can see, is this person able to stay on the spot? What's this spatial awareness and control like? What is it like one side to the other? What's their ability to accept force and land or these movements at the side? We've potentially got a different side to side around quality. Again, now we're starting to look at other things 
other than just symptoms. But those things are going to be a big part of a return to high and fast loading. So it's good to be able to, to get a get a grasp of where somebody is at with it. And let's have a look at a triple hop for distance. So we set up and then it is one, two, three, and then we stick. So it may take you several goes to be able to have a go at that. Then we would have, if we were able to measure, we'd be able to measure from this back to the start, do this on the other side. So again, firstly, has that produced irritating symptoms? And when my knee was really irritated, just one step, and that was end of test, couldn't do it. And then once I get past that, so now I am able to triple hop which is, again, the levels that we're going to work through later. Um, is there a difference between how far I can triple hot, hop on my left side and my right? And if there's a 50 cent difference, this is what Pete Maliaris um, has, has found to be a, a marker for seeing a significant difference in power left to right, then you know, that is going to be significant because more often than not, the symptomatic leg is going to be the more powerful leg. So if we're 50 centimeters short on that side, then it gives us again, the basis for power-based training to be able to bring that up as in terms of preparation over, over the duration of a rehab program for return to sport. So that's a really helpful thing to know. And again, I'll just come back to it here. This as a series of progressive tests, really, really helpful to know. You can use my slides, um, but they're things that you want to be able to, to, be, to be able to put people through. Here's an outcome measure, the, the Victorian Institute for Sport uh, for patella, which we would use for functional, uh, functional uh, outcome measures of, of, knee, uh, of knee function. We've got one of these, of these uh, uh, for the Achilles as well. And again, I've linked that in there, but you can Google that if you want to be able to want to be able to have that. Now, when it comes to assessment and what again, what hopefully the grasp of what you've got from everything that I've done with you so far is that we're not going to be just looking at the patella. OK, and again, you can go and have a look and subscribe to the research course with Pete Maliaris around these to, to get to dive far deeper into each individual component including things like the biomechanics of, of tendinopathy um, but we need to be able to look at the knee and the, all the other structures around the knee in our assessment process as well so here is what the here is what the assessment criteria or the assessment testing excuse me will look like for a patella tendinopathy so we need to be able to test the local muscle tendon unit unit with an objective test we can't be doing this the research is so clear with manual muscle testing it just doesn't it's, so, it's there's so many flaws to that in terms of objectivity for progression in, in tolerance and capacity that we have to be able to test a true a true reflection of the muscle tendon unit and the way that we can do that with um, with a powerful muscle like the patella is going to be the old-fashioned leg extension that almost all leisure center and conventional gyms will have but that is going to be the best way for being able to test single leg compared to the other side without other muscles and bodies and uh, body parts um, adapting to be able to compensate that's a wonderful part of being human is that we can compensate and overcome amazing amazing imbalances missing limbs and etc but if we have a, a deficiency in our patella tendon which is the, the uh, an important part of a patella tendinopathy we need to be able to isolate it so in this instance the most functional thing we can do is isolate and again that's something that a lot of people will 
will miss in terms of the nuance of what functional rehab is. Functional rehab is only squatting, lunging, things that look like real life. Well, if we want to be functional in re-establishing the low tolerance of the patella tendon, isolated movement of the leg extension is king. And if we look at uh, Pete Maliaris's targets, he's developed in his lab 30 to 60 kilograms. That range is for a six rep max and with a heavy slow resistance tempo. So we've covered heavy, we've covered tempo prescription. That's three seconds up, three seconds down. And the 30 kilograms is for a sedentary population. The 60 is more in line with an athletic population. And the caveat there though is also that is going to be based on numbers in his gym. So I've got a leg extension in the gym that I work out of, have to be able to play and establish what would be an appropriate an appropriate alternative for where we work out on but it is important that we do have one other options if we don't have a gym will include things like the, the 60 second wall sit but as i mentioned there before the um, you know if, if me for example someone who trains someone who keeps himself strong if you were to test me in this leg uh, 60 second wall sit, even in my most symptomatic i pass that pretty fine because my glutes, because my hamstrings, because everything else can, can compensate. But when you put me on this leg extension and those things can't happen, you would have been able to expose an almighty deficiency that my body was um, exposed on there. So we've got a six rep max test that we need to do for the quad um, muscle tendon. Then also we need to do the equivalent behind or a test behind the posterior chain so being able to do bridge leg curls we could do a six rep max and looking at different levels for that or we could do uh, an endurance for 10 to 15 rep max we'll be covering that in the hamstring session but i'm going to touch on it here we can test the abductors of the hip and the knee which is going to be glute medius and side lion and calf function is going to be important as well because the way that that inserts is a big factor in knee performance so in the Achilles, we will be covering that, but we have testing for endurance in standard and also a six rep max on a bent leg, which is something that a lot of people miss. I certainly don't see loads of people training their bent leg because it looks good on their bent leg calf race because it looks good on the beach. But the soleus is the powerhouse of our plantar flexors and running, and it definitely is an important thing that we need to be considering in our rehabilitation. So I've got some videos here around doing a doing a couple of these tests. So I'm going to I'm going to play this one. Okay, and we're going to do it with a heavy slow resistance tempo, which means that we're going to be doing it for three seconds up and then three seconds down. It's a six second cycle for the tempo, and we're going to work to try to achieve what our true six rep max is. Okay, so far, it's going to look like this. You get yourself set up into the machine that gets our set up to the tempo pad of the huge tier set to adjust the best. Thank you. 
So that would be your six rep max testing. I apologize for the music on at the same time there, but I couldn't turn it off to be able to get the filming done. That's when we were open. And um, the important thing there is most people don't know how to do six rep max testing. So you have to be able to do an accurate six reps, three seconds up, three seconds down. Remember, we're probably load managing flexion, which means we're not going to need to go really deep. We just want to see what range that we're able to do. Maybe even can't even do the end range at the top, but we want to be able to do as much as we can. Then we would rest and then increase the weight until we establish it. Let's have a look at the wall sit, should you not have access to a gym. So in terms of strength testing the quadriceps, the leg extension is by far the most accurate way that we can get an objective, isolated measure of, of our knee extension strength. And not everyone has got access to a gym and there is a, an alternative that we can use which is a single leg ball sit. Um, it has some limitations because the very nature of it being a squat position means that we are able to compensate for deficits in strength from one side by using our glutes, using our calves more so than we can on the, the knee extension. But that being said, we can still see strength deficits from side to side in a 60 second single leg also. So how that would look is I would get myself about a foot away from or as far away as I need to be to be able to sit and get about this 90 degree angle at the knee and from here I would take my foot off the floor and then I would start my clock. So I'm staying nice and upright and now that is going to be um, potentially very difficult on our quads. So first and foremost the goal would be can we stay here for 60 seconds? Okay now what you will, might find is if you've had a knee patella, a patella tendinopathy that one side to the other is much harder, shaking, lots more going on and that can be our mark for being able to, to, to measure strength changes over time if we don't have access to a gym. It's 30 seconds. Here is a demonstration of why the importance of doing this single leg is because when we take, for example, my leg here, my right leg was you know, fine symptomatic, so if I did it two-legged, then my right leg is going to take over and not expose the deficit. And when I do it single leg here, if you can see there, there's an enormous shaking going on as my quad is having to deal with the load without my good leg taking over. So again, um, the intramuscular coordination of driving this single leg isolation, super important um, because people will be able to compensate if allowed to. But that being said, it may be that someone is not able to do single leg. So here's an example of applying it just with a two leg. Oh, 
So there was an example uh, of me working with Mr. David Sennett in the start out of his program and I was taking his notes for him there and writing it down for him. I would prefer and I teach most people to take notes themselves. I'll be responsible for remembering my own training without taking notes on it, never mind other people's. Again, locus of control, shift in responsibility, they've got to be able to do it away from us. So that is testing the muscle tendon unit. Really important we can get that as a baseline for the patella tendon and then being able to apply the, the 40 to 60 rep as a goal or to be able to balance and level up with their non-injured leg because that might be where you see the massive difference if you test the non-injured leg and see the size of the difference due to pain inhibition and symptoms. So that's super important to be able to to be able to get those objective. Now to be able to do the posterior chain, this is how we or how I would approach a hamstring um, bridge up to be able to test the, and this would be could be done from a, a strength perspective or a endurance perspective. I'm going to play the start of this video because what you need to be able to do with these, because where with the leg extension you can just change the weight. When you're talking about body weight work, often the way that we increase the intensity is through leverage. So we need to know different levels of progressions. So I will give an example of this, but we'll probably spend more time on it when we get to the hamstring session. Right, with testing endurance on the hamstring complex, we are going to review the bridge exercises that we have hopefully well, we've either, we've either been able to pass in terms of pain tolerance, and now we are going to increase the, uh, the duration of the, of, of the reps to be able to turn it into more into training. Or we have load managed up to this point, taking these out as we've, um, as we've built ourselves back up. Okay, so now we're going to need to if we're testing, we're going to need to go through each level of the of the bridge tracks and we're looking for 10 to 15 reps that we can perform with a heavy slow resistance tempo, which is three seconds up, three seconds down. Okay, so in this short lever, two-legged version, Kelly's arms are going to be just on her chest or somewhere just not on the floor. And from here, I'm going to acute Kelly and maybe would have taught us at this point to a posture of pelvic tilt. So that's going to bias the hamstrings and then she's going to come up for three, two, one, the top, three, two, one, to the bottom. So you've got that tempo for me now and we're going to go for uh, just show me four or five reps. That's my watch. Two, one, down, three, two, one. So now I would let Callie go here now until she's able to do 10 to 15 reps and then I'd stop her. So that feels quite comfortable for you and have a rest. So if we have just done that with someone, we would let someone have uh, a minute, two minutes um, to be able to rest. Is that what I'm That's okay. Um, to be able to uh, rest and then go into the next level. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing on the next level, which is going to be offset. So this one's going to be in a short lever, so it's going to be here. This one's going to be a little bit further forward, so there's contact in the floor, and we're going to be putting most of our weight through here. So now you're going to show me the same tempo. Three seconds, up, two, one, top, three, two, one, down, three, two, one, up, three, two, one, down, three, two, one, up, three, two, one. So to keep going, it's a six second, really good tempo, and it was nice and clean, and that would be an acceptable place for us to be training for sets of you know, three to four sets of 10 to 15 reps. I am going to give you a moment, and then we're going to do the opposite leg. 
into an elevated position. Okay, so this is going to be where a lot of our athletes need to get to be training is these reps, long kneeling, that long lever, and elevated, which is going to really ramp up the load on the hamstring. Okay, so as soon as you're ready, this leg's had a nice rest, so we should be able to get straight into it. Um, but of course, if you're testing someone from real life, you're going to want to do this on both sides because they have likely got an injured and a non-injured side, so that's going to be really important. Um, but we're going to go through and do the same thing now, just with the heel, with leg elevated. Now this could be on my shoulder, but I like it put it on uh, in, in a way that someone can do it themselves. And we're going to go long lever, so just scoot yourself away from a little bit. So we want this long lever position here. This leg's going to come up again, up just out of the way. We're going to be really hooking the heel into the log, into, the, into whatever we've got on here. And we're going to try and come up for three, two, one, up. Three, two, one, count. Two. Angle of the knee, you keep count. Angle of the knee stays the same, but the hinge in the hip is what changes. One, up. Three, two, one, down. Three, two, one, up. Three, two. You're trying to cue to keep it nice and smooth. It's a really tough level, this, all the way to the top. Hamstring's probably squeezed, it's screaming. Toes are going to be pointing the calves and all the are going to be wanting to come into this. So, I'll stop that. I'll stop playing that there just purely because you get the idea. But what we need to be able to do there is to be able to have the series of levels. And if we're testing the hamstring complex, Two-legged short lever bridge up, two-legged B stance, which is the second one we looked at there. One-legged short lever, one-legged elevated short lever, one-legged elevated long lever. Okay, and then you know some one of those levels for someone is going to be a six rep max. Maybe another level is going to be a ten to fifteen rep max. Now, if you're testing a hamstring, you're probably going to do heavy slow resistance. If the hamstring is the symptomatic, or some sort of hamstring tendinopathy or a pulled hamstring, you're probably not. You're probably going to do a a heavy slow resistance tempo but in this instance here where the presentation is going to be the patella then we could do these with a with a more a, a more typical tempo that might represent training like two seconds down and up as fast as you can shouldn't irritate the knee especially if the knee's not in deep flexion so that's all up for being able to be being able to to manipulate i've got nordics in there because they're nice progressions on hamstring conditioning but I wouldn't be putting those into the patella because, as we mentioned before, compression and kneeling is going to wind the patella up. So that is not something that you would do as one of your first considerations. The calf function, this is where we will be getting to, um, to being able to look at testing plate loaded. So this is a bent leg and this is a Smith's machine that um, some people may have access to being able to use. I'm going to show you how we might do it if we don't have access to a Smith's machine and we can do it on a, um, do it with plates. Some points of set up a plate loaded bent leg calf raise which is a really helpful training drill for building up our calf and our Achilles, in particular if our Achilles is painful. Now as long as you've got a bench and access to plates, this is how I like you to have a go of setting up. Some people find it a little bit awkward and it will be until you get used to it. Okay? But as long as you stack up your plates next to you here, you should be able to slide them on and then slide them off. As a goal, we're looking for being able to do heavy slow resistance for about 1.4 uh, for six reps for about 1.4 times our body weight. So that's a goal that we want to work to be able to do before we're really doing the running. And I'm currently just about 100 kilos. So 1.4 of that single leg is going to be 140. So I'm currently working on these 25 plates. And so four of those is 100. So I'm going to slide them on into this position here. Best off sliding them on onto two legs. Get a 
cells organize and then shift their neurons will work. If I put this on here, that's 110. Now I'm going to shift it over onto. I'm going to be able to manhandle the weight. Depending on the type of plate that you're using, it might have some awkward lines, etc., on it. But I want to be able to shift the weight then so that it sits on our single leg. This other leg can just stabilize us wherever we want to be. And then we want to be able to get our knee forward of our toes. We want to be able to get the calf raise in the line of drive that we're going to have through a running stride. That's what makes this exercise possibly a superior one to be able to do it on a machine. Although that is a good option as well if that's all you have access to. Okay, so then I'm going to come up for three, two, one, all the way up onto my big toe, down to three, two, one, zero. Up, three, two, one. Resist the temptation to lean back, keep that line of drive. Knee over toe, up onto big toe. Once you find that level, six reps, shift the weight back onto two legs and you have a little rest there if need be. Over onto the other side, now I'm in control of it. Get myself end, of, end range of ankle, ankle dorsiflexion, and perform maybe some resistance reps. Traps in tight, back to this position, and then we can safely get our plates off us, start our clock, and that's how I will train my bent legs while I'm currently working on with my Achilles until I'm able to do that with 140 kilograms. I also have a step underneath my foot. To slightly change the range of movement of pathways. So the research on that by which is by Sadhus that there seems to be or suggests there seems a protective amount of strength of the 1.4 times body weight. Um, the tempo that is done on that is actually with a with a one zero one zero tempo. So again, if the Achilles is symptomatic. We're going to go with heavy, slow resistance. But again, in this instance, if the emphasis is patella, then you would be, you know, you could argue that you could do a one zero one zero tempo if someone has a technique. Maybe you need to slow it down so someone can, um, someone can really feel and learn the movement, especially if they're got set up where they're using their plates, which can be a little bit awkward. But this is a version here using a Smith's machine that you can load these up really heavy and. <clears throat> You know, in our gym here, we have got a bent, bent leg calf raise machine. Um, that's perfectly good, and, and, and a lot of people use it here for bodybuilding. From a vector perspective of force and loading, it doesn't carry across to the Achilles function in running as well as loading up the position of Achilles loaded in running. So that's uh, the representative design um, component of that. Now, get, it's getting close to 11. So I am going to take you through now the standing um, calf raise test because this has very useful implications to be able to do this for a lot of programs, not just the knee, which we're talking about here, but for the Achilles, for balanced training programs, for falls programs, because not many people know how to do a strict, accurate calf raise test. And when they do, they are often very surprised what their score stacks up against normative data, which I'll share with you now as well. But let's have a little look at the technique for a strict calf endurance single leg. Right, from 
we're testing calf um, and calf and Achilles function, and we want to get an accurate measure, measure of the endurance of that function, we need to be able to do a single leg or a calf raise test. Okay? And there's a lot of ways that our body will cheat, and people will do a lot of reps if we don't make it strict. And when we do make it strict, and which is what the, the research on the normative data that we have on these for, for age groups show that people generally will not be able to do too many of these. Okay, so we're going to always take someone through the, the technique and give them a few goes to be able to be able to perform the technique with good form. Then they'll have a rest, and then we go to a tempo of one second up, one second down, until we have reached the point that we can't retain that tempo, we can't get up. Okay, so I'm going to use um, use Callie as an example where we're going to have Callie next to the wall and she's going to have her one hand overhead. Now Callie's small enough that she's able to do this in here. If it was me, I'd be in the ceiling, so I'd need to go outside or have another way of being able to check. But what this enables Callie to do is to be able to reach up as high as she can and be able to reach that same point with each rep. Okay, and from here, she's going to keep the leg straight and then she's going to take this leg into 90 degrees here and then we're going to come up onto the big toe for one second, sliding up the wall and then down for one second. Up for one second, down for one second. Keep going for five or six reps. And what a lot of people will do is they will, as you come this time, lean forward. They will come forward because that will make it mechanically easier so we want to be able to correct people and try and get them if we can get people focusing on their hand going up into this vertical plane then that's going to help keep us true we want to make sure that we're coming up onto the big toe have a rest coming up onto the big toe because we will want to then roll onto the outside of the feet when we can't maintain range okay how was that Okay. When they're done strict, people will generally do a lot less than they expect. And um, if you feel good, then we're going to try and have a go at, at sticking to a, uh, a tempo of one second up, or one second down. Do you want to do that leg or do you want to do the other one? Yeah. Turn around and face the other way then. So from this one now, so you're going to try and stay strict with all of those cues. This leg's going to stay up so that we can keep a truly single leg. And as soon as you're ready, go up for one and that's big toe. Two. Three. So that's one second. Top. Bottom. Oh, we are. So someone will be needing to count, and this is the speed that we maintain the speed, and we will find a point that we can't go any further. And that would then we would want to be able to have what that score is for the left leg, also for the right leg. And if someone wasn't able to do a single leg half raise, we would do the exact same thing with two legs, two feet. So just while I let that play there of the of doing a two-legged strip car phrase with Mr. David Sennett, um, you can see what people will do to mechanically make it easier. So David Sennett here, you can see his body light is falling forward so that that can pull him up into a car phrase. Okay, um, so where possible, we want to be keeping people strict, which is what you saw me taking Cali through there. And then I recommend that you guys have a go at doing this yourself so that you know and feel where all the places you want to be able to cheat to be able to achieve more reps than your calf complex can actually do because what that enables you to then
What that then enables you to do is to be able to look at this Hebert Lozier normative data to be able to see, okay, what should a 20 year old be able to do with a, in terms of a, an amount of reps for a single leg calf raise? Done exactly how I was taught there with a one second up, one second down, being accountable to the wall, not leaning forward, staying on, coming onto the big toe. Okay, so maybe in tw at 20 years of age, someone maybe doesn't seem, it doesn't seem that important. But then when we come all the way down to maybe seeing 80 years of age, where we should be able to do uh, males uh, nine or 10 reps, both sides and females 13 or 15 reps, you know, if we're working with someone and they can't do a single calf raise, you know, we've got, we've got a really good argument here for being able to train and build up their capacity to be able to do that functional independence, carry over to quality of life, all of these things. But we, it is something I wanted to be able to cover in this session today because it is part of a thorough um, knee assessment, uh, which we need to be doing with the patella tendinopathy, as well as potentially dorsiflexion. So if someone has got, um, you know, if you take someone into a dorsiflexion test, we keep the heel on the, on the floor, and then you take the knee as far past the toe as you can. Then when you go to a bent leg, which takes the calf out, you should be able to get a little bit further. If we don't, then it, the implications could be that we have a bit of a tight Achilles, whatever that may be, but it could be a contributing factor. And that's, um, uh, this is what Pete Maliaris's group have shown, that when, if someone has a limited dorsiflexion, that it could be loading up the knee more that's predisposed them to why they're jumping, for example, might, you know, this is on the guy at the bottom right here, when he jumps, he has his heels off the floor. Is that his anatomy? Is that a tight calf? Probably going to be uh, all of the different factors entwined. But what they found with this study was that a jump retraining program where they shifted the loading to being more of a hip, or more proximal, so they're more of a, more of a hip type um, loading into jumping seemed to improve the patella symptoms. So there's an argument for either training someone to jump and recruit their more powerful muscles in their ass, or maybe it's just because they're doing something differently again whilst symptoms are settling down. So both, both building up and load managing are going to be, are going to be important in working with, with your Achilles. But this is your slide that you need to be uh, thinking about now when you have your person, we are load managing flexion and we're load managing it above 90 degrees. So that's why things like kneeling, that's why um, things like loaded deep squatting, things like that is going to be very provocative. And we're going to want to not do that or you're going to be wanting to encourage people to not do that for a while. Equally, the high and fast load, we're going to want to load manage which is going to be your running, particularly running downhill, where we're going to have to either reduce significantly by up to maybe 50% or even 100%. I've definitely had to reduce mine by 100% whilst I build up through targeted loading and load managed provocative activities to grade back in in a consistent way that my body can adapt to. There is adjunctive things that we can be doing simultaneously. That will include things like manual therapy, could be, again, a bit like the jump retraining. It could be simply changing your footwear so that you have more of a heel or less of a heel to be able to change the loading through the knee. This is a link to a patella taping um, video where you can offload the loading through the patella by strapping it so that it is tracking slightly differently. I don't do, I, I don't do strapping, um, but there's a video there for illustrating how that could be something that is done as an adjunctive as an adjunctive component with this load management program. And that is as far as I'll get, we're eight minutes past. Big Sam. How um how useful is the patella strapping or is it more of kind of like a placebo kind of thing? Because like I, I, I struggle with patella tendency for for many, many years. And I tried loads of different strapping, but lo loads of different clubs said different things like, oh, it doesn't do anything, or we can do it if you want to, but it doesn't really help. Some people said it did help a lot, but I, I, don't, I just wanted to get your point. 
What did you show, what have you found personally with, with different strapping that you've done? Um, I don't know what, probably just a placebo. I haven't really, I haven't really felt a big difference, but they just do the rubbish taping where they just like turn it around into a string and then just put it on the bottom of my patella. There's no proper taping like this. So, I, <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, the research, the research on taping, which is put in here shows that it, it isn't really much better than placebo and arguably you could say that it is placebo. Um, but when you're, if you're an athlete and we can change the load and what you can do is you're able to, you know, I had uh, Reese, who's, who's a part of my company, Reese Shawnee, he's a team GB physio and he used to have to strap me when I used to play. And there's no question that I had a high buy-in with him. Just mentioned there, team GB, all of a sudden the placebo genesis has just gone up, but there was no doubt that the way that he used to strap me was different to other people that made my knee, for example, if I had, um, and I've had periods of knee pain throughout my life, I'm sure anybody who's been an athlete has, you know, a firm strapping that does change the loading through the knee, my experience was that it enabled me to carry on training whilst my symptoms were down a little bit. So the research is pretty clear that it's not much more than placebo. Um, and that's why it's in here as an adjunct that must go alongside all of the more, more important things like finding load managing what the provocative thing is and then building up our capacity. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we'll leave it there, guys. This is ten past. I hope that um, I hope that made uh, made some sense, and you can follow that. As you can see, the uh, the point I got to here was. Next week, we will be building on the four levels of what it might be to go from level one through to return to play types of exercises and examples of programming for you to be able to be to be to be using. OK, so uh, I'll upload this to Blackboard and I shall see you guys in a couple of weeks.